In this video, I'm going to talk about why we might sometimes want to encourage groups to participate in just unstructured free-for-all discussion, like people hanging around a committee table having a conversation, and why we might sometimes want to create a more careful communication process, like we saw with the Delphi method, where people are just exchanging numeric information about their beliefs. Now, we started off so far by developing a theory about a network model of belief formation, which tells us that when groups participate in uh, decentralized networks where everybody's equally influential, collective intelligence will improve belief accuracy. But when group conversation is dominated by a small number of individuals, then the groups will produce the wisdom of the few instead of the wisdom of crowds. Now, in order to apply this theory to group discussion, I need to advance the following hypothesis. And my hypothesis is that unstructured discussion acts like a centralized network. Now, it's actually pretty intuitive, right? In a conversation, there's a lot of different ways that people can become more influential. Some people might just talk a whole lot, and that makes them influential. Some people might be, you know, really handsome or, or physically attractive, and that could uh, in, increase their influence over the group of the whole. Some people might make really convincing arguments or claim to expertise. Even if they don't deserve that claim, or even if their arguments are wrong, they might still become more influential. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at one particular mechanism that allows people to become more influential, and that's talkativeness. Now, in this previous study, we saw that stubbornness was correlated with accuracy. People who were more accurate were also more stubborn. So you might intuitively think that people who are more talkative are also more accurate, but I'm just going to give away some of the results. It turns out that that's not the case. And that's also pretty intuitive because talkativeness is really more of a personality feature. So I was raised, I had uh, in a big family, I had six brothers. Um, so conversation around the dinner table was like a battle. You had to fight to get a word in edgewise. So I became a really talkative person and that's just my nature. If you ask me something I know a lot about, I'm gonna talk a lot. If you ask me something I know very little about, I'm gonna talk very little. So we have this idea that just whenever you let people hang out in an unstructured discussion, they end up showing statistical properties that will be more like a centralized network than a decentralized network, even if the communication network is decentralized in the sense that everybody can observe everybody. They're all equally connected. Okay, so the question becomes, what does this mean if unstructured discussion acts like a centralized network? And if we want to get some evidence for this, what kind of clues will we look for? So in order to talk this through, uh, I need to work through a pretty technical statistical claim, but that will pay off dividends later when you're trying to think about how group dynamics impacts decision making. So the claim uh, it emerges from what happens when you have a centralized opinion leader. So remember, in our first study, we found that it, central individuals determined group dynamics. So when a central individual held a belief that was in the direction of the true answer, the group became more accurate. Now notice I didn't say when the central individual was accurate, because it could happen that a central individual is wildly inaccurate. Maybe their belief is completely wrong, but by sheer coincidence, they, they uh, pull the group in the direction of the transfer. They could be way off in left field, but if the group needs to move a little bit towards left field to become more accurate, that central opinion leader could end up, by sheer coincidence, improving the accuracy for the group as a whole. So this ends up determining the statistical dynamics of how actual conversation happens. So, so let's talk about how that happens. Suppose that this diagram represents a statistical distribution of beliefs. So the bottom, the x-axis, is those beliefs, and the y-axis is how popular they are. And so let the, let's say the red line shows the average belief of the group at the beginning of the conversation. 
let's say the blue line shows where the actual true answer is. So in this example, 20% of the people are on the truth side of the average, and 80% of the people are on the, the, the incorrect side of the average. So if we were to just randomly select someone to be an opinion leader, then there's a 20% chance that that opinion leader will pull the group in the correct direction. And there's an 80% chance that that group will pull the group, that, that that opinion leader will pull the group away from the true answer. So what this means is whether or not centralized networks, and now we're talking about group discussion here because that's our hypothesis, whether or not centralized discussions improve belief accuracy is not simply a yes or no question, but it depends on the statistical properties of that belief distribution. And this is huge because it tells us that it's, even, it's not simply a question of whether communication is good or bad for group decisions, but we have to start looking at contingencies like group structure. But now I'm saying it's not even a simple question of whether one group structure or another group structure is good for decisions, but it depends on the actual statistical properties of the question you're asking, which means whether or not your group will benefit from a centralized communication structure depends on what question your group is answering. So that's my claim. Now I want to back it up with a little bit of evidence. And I'm going to be talking very generally about some research that we did. The results I'm showing were actually replicated across a couple different studies, but I'm going to keep this pretty high level in, in terms of concepts so I can move through it quickly. Basically, what we did was we ran another experiment following our same paradigm. So we had people come in from the web. We asked them some, some uh, estimation tasks. We then let them hang out in a chat room. So they're literally just in a chat room online talking to each other. And then we asked them a question again. And what we do is we compare the initial answer and the final answer. And we say, did the group become more or less accurate after having that conversation. So now we're having people actually hang out in the chat room and have a conversation. Um, so in order to facilitate this, we had a whole lot of people come to the website at the same time. Hundreds of people come to the website at the same time. We randomly assigned them to either be in this chat room condition so it's just, just people hang out having a conversation, or we put them into a numeric exchange condition, which corresponds to the very famous Delphi method. And this is what I talked about in my last video. We're actually replicating this because we're using new questions. And we're using new questions because there's only so long you can talk about how many gumballs are in a jar. And we want to start getting things a little more nuanced. We're trying to push this research forward. So we're using questions like we give them a description of a crowdfunding campaign and ask, how much money do you think this crowdfunding campaign raised? Or we give them a picture of a famous painting and ask, what do you think this painting uh, uh, got at auction? Or we ask trivia questions like, say, we'll say something like, there were so many flights in the US in 2018. We give them some number and say, how many of them do you think went through New York City? So one of the three airports in New York. And that actually gives something people can talk about. And when we look at the chat transcripts, I can say people are actually hang out and having real conversations. So this experiment turns out to be a good way to test the effect of conversation on group beliefs. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to take each experimental trial. So an experimental trial is one group answering one question, and we're going to start by measuring them at the beginning, and we're going to say what percentage of people are on the truth side of the group answer. So if we were to just randomly pull opinion leaders out of the group, what's the probability that this person will pull the group in the direction of the correct answer. And remember, that's our task feature. That's this task contingent property that will determine how centralized information impacts belief accuracy. And what we find is that this task feature dramatically determines whether the group improves as a whole. So what you see in the right-hand side of this chart 
are those groups where a majority of people were on the correct side of the truth and the group as a whole improved. On the left-hand side of this chart, you see those cases where only a small fraction of people were on the true side of the answer and we say that the group got worse. Now, what I'm saying basically is that there's a majority effect in group discussion. That groups are simply pulled towards the belief of the majority. And that seems really intuitive, but first I wanna make one important distinction. This isn't something that happens in a single group. There's no such thing as a majority in a single group when you're just asking numeric estimates, right? What we're showing here is a statistical property that emerges over many trials to start to understand the kind of dynamics that shape groups. In an individual group, the only thing that matters is who the most influential person is, or in this case, what I'm claiming is the most talkative person. Now, one way we can see that this isn't just some general majority effect that governs all of human interaction is by comparing these outcomes to what happens in the Delphi method or numeric exchange groups. In these groups, we see no effect of that task property at all. So this proportion towards truth has no bearing on whether or not groups improve across the board. As we figured out in the last video, this numeric exchange process just leads a majority of groups to become more accurate. Now, my claim right now is that this is driven by this underlying mechanism that group discussion acts like a centralized network, but we don't actually need that mechanism to start to un ravel some of the mysteries that motivated this study. Remember, we started from this place where, where we're coming into a field where some people say discussion is good, some people say discussion is bad, some people say any social information undermines belief accuracy. So without even getting the mechanisms, right here we have the solution to that. If you were to study a group that asked a certain type of question, maybe it's the the, the crowdfunding type question. If that type of question puts you in the, in the task space on the left-hand side of these figures, you're gonna get results that make it look like numeric exchange is better than unstructured discussion. And if you were to run an experiment or study an organization, you come away with the idea that just letting people talk produces groupthink. We have to constrain them. We have to use the Delphi method. But if you had used a task that put you into the right-hand side of the space, task that produced a different kind of statistical distribution, you might have come away with the conclusion that unstructured discussion is actually better than numeric exchange. And that's really critical. So what we're saying is that whether one type of communication or another type of communication looks better depends on the type of question that you're studying. Now, I do want to try to provide at least a little bit of evidence that this mechanism is driven by talkativeness, centralization, as I'm going to call it, which is to say that some people talk more than others. And that's because the way we design interventions, the way we design processes depends on what's producing outcomes. So what I did was I very simply went to each group and said, who's the most talkative individual in that group? And then I asked, did that talkative individual have an answer that would have pulled the group in the right direction or the wrong direction? And what I find is that when we have groups where the most talkative person has a belief pulling in the right direction, those groups are likely to improve. We saw about 65% of those groups became more accurate. But when that talkative individual has a belief that would pull in the wrong direction, we find that those groups improve only about 40% of the time. So this evidence uh, helps to support my claim that the role of task contingency in group discussion is driven by this emergent centralization based on who's talkative. So what does this mean for us in the end? First of all, what it means is that collective intelligence is contingent on communication format. Whether your group benefits from information exchange depends on how 
they're exchanging that information? Are they exchanging it through a carefully mediated process like the Delphi method, or are they exchanging information through just hanging out and having a conversation? And we're not saying that conversation is always bad. What we're saying is that conversation is unreliable. When you have a group that's engaging in unstructured discussion, whether or not they benefit from that depends on just some statistical properties of their of their question that you may not know going into it. But on the other hand, this numeric exchange, this, this structured Delphi method does turn out to be a fairly reliable way of improving belief accuracy regardless of the task. However, if you're going to ask yourself, do I need to constrain my group? Well, it turns out that collective intelligence is also contingent on task properties. Now, there's no simple intuitive way to determine which tasks fall into which categories right now. It's just a matter of calibrating your particular process to your particular task. And that's why I spent a little extra time in this video going through some of the more nitty gritty statistical details. Now, even without thinking too much about the statistics, we can actually draw a few tentative conclusions about strategies that we might employ. So one strategy will be anything that promotes equal participation. So one particularly clever solution I've heard along these lines is just to put some clocks on the wall that tracks how, many, how much time each person in the group has talked. The idea being that if people see how much more they're talking than everyone else, they might back off a little bit. This is something that might be particularly possible with digital communication. Now, another idea that I really like is to actually encourage smaller group interaction rather than larger group interaction. And the idea being that when you have a, a bunch of overlapping small groups, they can allow information exchange throughout the organization as a whole, but since people are in small groups, that limits how much one person can be overly dominant on the organization as a whole. So what you can think about this in terms of our day-to-day -day lives is like a group chat message, right? So I might be in a group chat with my lab members on the one hand, and maybe I'm in a separate group chat with my, my boss and some of the other administrators, and I serve as a conduit of information flow between those two group chats, but because they're then also chatting with other people in the network that I can't see, that limits my influence to the group as a whole. So I call that sparse decentralized networks, and I wanna highlight that that's a little bit speculative. These are some things you can look for going forward. Now, I want to close by just commenting on, on that this final video that I'm going to be showing to you next is going to place some really important boundary conditions on all of the work and the strategies that I've discussed so far. And, and they're going to give us a few more final considerations to think about when designing a decision-making process.